Now there is some debate that we had, just so you know, there was a little debate going on before church started with some of the brothers. And we were debating whether or not Carlos was actually wearing a pink jacket. We haven't really concluded, but we appreciate his security. He's a very secure person. That's right. <laughs> Look at that. Come on. There you go with this. Pretty awesome. Uh, just a couple things uh, from an announcement from that we kind of said already. But, um, you know, normally we do a, a toy drive every year. And uh, actually the, the couple organizations we worked with last year basically said they're not doing a toy drive. Um, and so, so this kind of helps us even in a sense of let's focus more with what Aramis already has set up. So as a family group, we, we pick a child and we can bring it on December 18th. Yeah. But like I said, we, we literally, we are working with uh, two organizations and they're doing something completely different uh, this year. And so that's, that's why we're not. So if you're wondering, why aren't we doing a toy drive? That's the reason. Everybody got that? Yeah. Um, you know, and obviously those things change from year to year. And so that's one of the things. Um, Okay, the other thing is, uh, this is kind of a, more of a legal thing, just so everybody knows. Uh, if you changed your email address in this past year, and please get an updated email address, either to your family group leader or to Lincoln, because every year, by law, we need to give you the contribution receipts. And so we're doing that via email. Everybody got that? And Because sometimes, you know, with emails, change and everything starts bouncing and you wonder why you didn't weren't included and so there you go. Does everybody understand? Yeah. Okay. And then next Sunday, um, Eric Richardson, he's actually going to be preaching the word. And, and so I want you guys to really encourage him, support him. I'm here and it's not like I'm on vacation or anything. It's just it's just an opportunity. Eric and I have been talking about it so um, it'll be something we can do. So, amen? amen? Okay, now last Sunday, Julius preached on, you guys remember? No, so long ago, it's like, oh my gosh. Hate the sin. And so I thought I'd preach on hate the sin, part. Actually not, I'm not going to preach on that. So, although this, this will be something along these lines, you will need your Bible. And we're supposed to bring it anyways. Amen. Uh, but for those who are more modern, you have it on your phone or your tablet. Okay? Like Julius. So let's see. What we're going to be talking about this morning is the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Holy Spirit. And, you know, the Holy Spirit is something that we can't be afraid to talk about. Yeah. We believe in the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. And we're going to get into some of those things. Uh, but I think there's a lot of confusion about the Holy Spirit. And, you know, we or even reactions. Because you may go something like, uh, Okay, but that is, you say I was speaking in tongues, but I was speaking in another language, yes. And that's really what tongues was. But there's confusion. And it had a purpose and a and a meaning, and, and, and so we, are, we have these experiences, but sometimes we equate them to the Holy Spirit, but maybe not. You know, people have said things in the name of the Holy Spirit, like a mass murderer, the Spirit told me to go take these people out. Literally, they, they, they quoted me. In the name of God, the Spirit told me. So I'm not saying that the Spirit doesn't tell you something. But I want us to get into our Bibles. You guys are ready? Yeah. All right? All right, so let's go. We'll start in Acts chapter 2. Because we want to talk about how does the Holy Spirit work today, right now? Okay, and this is where they... We're becoming Christians, verse 36. It says, Therefore let all Israel be assured that this God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart 
And said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? So they were trying to get right. They were moved. They were cut. They, they needed the earth. They heard the message about the cross. And so Peter gives the answer because they wanted to get right. And it'd be really bad if he got the wrong answer. He didn't have the wrong answer. Peter replied, repent be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then it says, you will receive what? The Holy Spirit. It says the promise is for you and your children and all those who are far off. For all whom the Lord God will call. And this is many other words. He warned them. He pleaded with them. Save yourself from this corrupt generation. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. And so they, they heard the message. They needed to find out, how do, I, how do I become a Christian? How do I respond to the cross? And Peter just says, well, you need to repent. Obviously, you're making Jesus Lord. And you need to be baptized. That's immersed. That's what the word literally means in the Bible. Immersed. Yeah. All the way under. So that's immersion. And it says you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is going to dwell in you. And you may go, well, how long does that take? Depends on the person. You never study this out. Study it out. But it doesn't have to take forever. These people, it doesn't, it didn't take them very long. They heard the message. They were moved. And they responded. So it can happen quickly. And other of us, some of us are more stubborn or we have more things to talk about or to work on. Okay? It doesn't matter. What matters is you get right with God. So it says when you become a Christian, all your sins are washed away by the blood of Christ, and you receive the Holy Spirit, this indwelling. So the first point is the Spirit lives, guess where? In us. Now, I can't see that, that monitor in the back, so I'm going to read it, but let me just a couple scriptures here. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 21 and 22. Now it is God who makes us both of us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us. He set his seal of ownership on us. He put his spirit where? In our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. The word in Greek is kind of like as, a, as earnest money. Kind of it's a, you know, for some of you who bought a house, you know, that's, you've got to put a deposit down, right? Earnest. But the Holy Spirit is giving. Jesus is going to move on and we get the Holy Spirit. That's a good thing. Yes. Come on, Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. It says, Now it is God who made us for this very purpose and has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what was to come. Second Timothy. Some of these aren't up there. Some of them are. <laughs> chapter 1, verse 14. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Paul saying this to Timothy. And he's reminding him. This is the one most people know. 1 Corinthians. I don't have it up there. By design. Chapter 6. Because you've got to stay alert, right? Verse 19. Do you not know that your body is the temple of what? The Holy Spirit. Who is in you, it says. Whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. So, if we believe the Holy Spirit is living in us, we need to take care of that temple. Galatians chapter, chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. It says, because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts. The Spirit calls out, Abba, Father, so that you are no longer a slave but a son. Since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. Now, most people know that the Spirit of God lives in them. Most of us have heard this before. But we don't know necessarily what the Holy Spirit does. So we go, amen. I'm glad I got the gift of the Holy Spirit. So what? And sometimes we think that way. But what does the Spirit do? What, what does this Holy Spirit, 
It dwells in you. In other words, when you were baptized into Christ, and it makes sense because the temple got clean, so now the Spirit can dwell in you. I mean, everything. You're, you're, you're all set. Spirit's in you. You don't come out of that water and it's just all, just all magic. You start doing all kinds of weird things. That's not what happens. But the Spirit of God is in you, the Bible says. So what does it do? So the second thing. He leads us and He convicts us. Now, look in John chapter 16. If you want to do a little further study, you can read John 14, 15, and 16. Amen. It's good to read chapters. Yeah. So, we'll start in verse 5. It says, Now I'm going to him who sent me, yet none of you ask me, Where are you going? Because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I'm going away. And unless I go away, the counselor will not come. But if I go, he will send you to him. But when he comes, he will convict the world. Who's going to do this? The Holy Spirit. Of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment in regard to sin. Because men do not believe in me in regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father, and where you can see me no longer, in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say, more than you can now bear, but when he, the Spirit, this is capital S, so if you read, you'll see sometimes it's capital S, and sometimes it's little s, lowercase, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. He will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from his mind and making it known to you. All this belongs to the Father's mind, and that is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. Now, so here's the thing. You go, wait a minute. Can the Holy Spirit work even when you're not a disciple? And what do you think the answer to that is? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because yeah. the Holy Spirit works through the Word and it can cut you to the heart. Right. I mean, it guides you. It, it works on you. It kind of prods you. Have you ever heard a message and it's like the Spirit is just convicting you? Yeah. On the inside, you know it's, it's, it's saying, come on, do something with this. And you can say it's a feeling. I don't necessarily think it's a feeling. Because I said feelings are dangerous. Not all of them. Today, maybe you woke up on the wrong side of the bed, to use an old expression. And you're not in a good mood. And you walked in and you're like, Rrr. I mean, we don't go by what we feel. Okay? Because our feelings can go like this. They're all over the place. Well, that's just... Don't want to rely on that. But at the end of the day, the Bible does say that the Spirit of God, it was a promise. He was talking to the apostles. It's going to come. He's going to guide you. He's going to convict. And we've been convicted. You can even be in your home and you're reading the Word, and all of a sudden you're like, ooh. Ooh. And the next day you're reading and it doesn't, you know, nothing happens. It convicts you. I don't know. What is the Spirit prompting you? Because you've heard, you have different brothers and sisters, they get up there, my heart is stirred, and, and they're moved, and, and they're convicted. Boy, the Spirit works in an amazing, amazing way. Paul says in Romans chapter 9, he says, you know, he talks about his conscience. He said, my conscience is not lying and is confirmed by, guess who? The Holy Spirit. I don't totally know how all this works. I'm just being honest with you. I, I encourage you to study it out. But your conscience or some, some kind of connection where the Spirit of God can get in there and work it. Do you ever have a guilty conscience? And, I mean, you're being tugged. The Bible says you can actually have a seared conscience, which means you, you have no feeling anymore. The Spirit's trying to work and trying to do something, but we don't want to have anything to do with it. But, wow, 
Sometimes we're afraid to say that we're being led by the Spirit. And yet it's all over the New Testament. Right? right. And we can't be like, we'll just be the stale Christians. We believe the Father, the Son, and, you know, what, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. For some reason, we talk about the Father, we talk about the Son, but the Spirit... That's, we don't really talk about it. And part of it is I think we don't study it out. We don't really know that much about it. And it's working in our lives. It's, it's, it's an inner voice. You ever have, you're out, maybe, uh, I use a gym as an example, but you're, you're out shopping, which you probably need the Holy Spirit if you're out shopping. <laughs> um, and, you know, and you're, you're out shopping, and you, for some reason, you, you, you see somebody, and it's like the Spirit saying, talk to that person. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then you have this inner battle going on. Yeah. Am I going to wimp out, or am I not? Okay? Yeah. Or you see somebody who's in need, and, and the Spirit is saying, I should help this person. And then your face, this battle's going on. I don't know if I want to help this person. I should help this person. I don't know. And you go back and forth. There is this little war, and it's working on your conscience. I can't, you know, so often I've seen in my own life where when you, you're, you're out and you can tell the Spirit said, go talk. And when you do, the person's open. And you didn't do anything. Maybe the whole day you were setting up a storm. Right? It's not really about you. The Spirit is working, and we can't be ashamed of it is the point. They weren't ashamed. And yet sometimes I think we are. So the point that I want to focus on the most is this last one. That is really small print. <laughs> it's living by the Spirit. That's why you need your Bibles or something right, right there. So Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. It says, verse 13, You, my brothers, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge in the sinful nature, rather to serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, live by, it says, the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit. And the Spirit, what is contrary to the sinful nature, they are in conflict with each other. So that you do not know, or you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. And the verse that all, most people have memorized in this church, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual morality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, uh, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, fists of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions and factions, and envy, drunken, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. I mean, he's not apologizing. Okay? You go, well, that's not a very popular message today. Well, that's just what the Bible says. <laughs> Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, is joy, is peace, is patience, is kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and ending one another. You know, keeping in step with the Spirit, if you ever decide, you know what, I've I got to get back in the game. Spiritually. The Spirit is saying, come on, I'm bored, let's go, let's get moving here. And we're like, no, no, I'm comfortable, I like my life. The Spirit is saying, move. And you're, you're just, we resist. 
Even sometimes they use those words in the Bible. Don't resist. Guess what? The Spirit. We know we should be in the game, spiritually speaking. But we want to stay comfortable. And if you read in that text, it talks about what, what kind of puts out the Spirit. It basically talks about biting and devouring one another. It talks about sin. Sin kills. The biting and devouring, gossip, slander. You want to take the spirit out of the church? Gossip. It is so hurtful. Slander somebody. It kills the spirit of the church. We all are sinners in this room. Me included. But are we being led? By the Spirit. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4. You guys all right? <laughs> Verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Then it says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit. With whom you were sealed on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ forgave you. You see, when we say something unwholesome, we're grieving the Holy Spirit. You've probably heard the phrase, loose lips. Saint ships. See, it's, it's really easy to do that. It's really easy to, in our marriages, for those who are married in here, to say something we should not say to our spouse. And usually, it, it's we're justified. Because this is what I'm feeling. And you don't understand. And that sword is blind. Take it off the head. This is what I'm feeling, and you hurt me, and because you hurt me, I can just destroy you. Yeah. With my mouth. With my words. Yeah. And it's the Holy Spirit is not happy. The Holy Spirit is, is convicting. Yeah. Are we following the Spirit, or are we following our sinful nature? Ephesians chapter 5. It says, uh, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, is verse 15. Make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, sing and make music in your heart. Always giving thanks to God, the Father, for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, be careful how you live. You've got to be led by the Spirit. Now, I'll give you an example. This is a simple glass. There you go. You even got a glass up on the screen. How about that? <laughs> so how do I get the air out of this glass? How do I suck the air out of it? Put some water in it. Yeah, then break it. You know, the only way we're going to do that is, as you guys know, you just fill it on up with water and it's no longer. So here you go. Salute. Okay. You fill it up. Amen. Yeah. Too often, we as disciples, we try to suck the sin out of our lives. We, we, we focus, I'm not going to sin, I'm not going to sin, I'm not going to sin. And what do we do? We sin. In Ephesians, what I just read, it says, should be up there, very small print. It says that you need to be filled with the Spirit. Have you ever noticed that you can run on empty spiritually? Yeah. Even the early church, they prayed. 
And we're not talking about the miraculous thing. That's a whole other study. But even in Acts 4 and Acts 5, we talked about they prayed and they were filled, as the Bible says, with the Holy Spirit. The place where their meeting was shaken and they were, they were bold. You, you Sometimes you don't want to share your faith. What do you need? You need boldness. So you call upon God. God, help me. Be filled. If the Spirit of God is full in us and in us, which I believe He is, if we focus more on living by the Spirit versus not sinning, God seems to be very aware of our sin. He seems to know exactly what it's all about. And, and, and so somehow we, get, we, we play this juggling match. And he's saying, no, no, you need to focus in on the Spirit and be led by the Spirit. And it's not this weird thing. It's being spiritual. I've ever heard somebody just say, hey, that, that person's a really spiritual person. I've also heard somebody say, that person's really worldly. Why? It's, it's their mindset. It's the way they think. It's the way they feel. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19, it says, Do not put out the Spirit's fire. And the word there is to extinguish, or don't quench the Spirit. To put it out. We can put out the Spirit's fire. We can kind of, we just want to douse it down. We, we just... Because it's, it's wanting to do something. It's wanting us to get moving spiritually. No, i got to turn it off. Because we know where that goes. Are we following the Spirit's lead? In Romans chapter 5, and this is a little more lengthy. Come on, go. Romans chapter 5. I'm sorry, chapter 8. Yeah, let's go. Well, this last one, this in, and we're going to wrap it up with this one in Romans chapter 8. But as we go through it, look at it. Look at what it's saying. Because as I said, as, as a church, if we're being led by the Spirit, there's something that's going to be different. Right. You know, Galatians chapter 6 says, The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature, will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. We gotta sow the Spirit. We gotta focus in on the Spirit. Now, in Romans chapter eight, verse five, and follow through. Follow me with this. It says, "Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires." But those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on what? What does it say? Spirit desires. And it's not talking some miraculous gift. This is what's everybody. The mind of the sinful man is death. But the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. So... You probably, if you look at your Christian life in the totality, there's probably been times where you've been in a bad space, where the mind is no longer set on the spirit, it's set on, I want to sin. I want to do what I want to do. You hear me say that all the time. Uh, but it's, it's, it's selfishness, in other words. And we get in this place where we just don't want to be bothered. We draw a line with God. Here's the boundary. i got to have my boundaries. A lot of books on that, so I'm going <laughs> to... And really, that boundary is the boundary of comfortability. It's, it's kind of masked. And the Spirit's saying, no! And we wonder why we don't have the peace. You see, there, there's something there. Then it says, it does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. And the Spirit of God lives in you, which was first point. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. Wow. So should we want the Spirit of Christ living in us? Hello? Okay. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, 
He raised Christ from the dead, will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit, who lives where? In you, it says. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation. But it's not to the sinful nature to live according to it. But if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Amen. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received, Acts chapter 2, you received the spirit of sonship, and for by him we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit, little s, small s, that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs of Christ, if indeed we share in sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Now, you could go down, we could read the whole thing, but I don't have time, but uh, just a couple things with it. Verse 22. Um, it says, we know the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but our, ourselves by the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we eagerly await our adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all, for who hopes it was already has? But if we hope for what we do not have yet, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. It doesn't say it takes away your weakness. For we do not know what we ought to pray for. That's probably most of the time, right? But the Spirit himself, what does it say? Intercedes for us with groans and words that cannot express. And who is he who searches our hearts and knows the mind of the Spirit? Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Now, there's a lot in here. This is deep stuff. I mean, this whole chapter. And my thing to all of us this morning is, are we being led by the Spirit? And it says here, you know, you're praying. You don't even know what to pray. But the Spirit intercedes. Now, God knows. This whole chapter goes back and forth that you and I still have a sinful nature. He's not saying you don't have it. But he's saying, what is your mindset about it? If you're focused on sin, guess what we'll do? We'll sin more. I mean, that's just... It's the problem. But if it's focused on God, His Spirit, you will sin less eventually. <coughs> And God's going to intercede, and the Spirit groans for you. He's taking care of your weaknesses. God already paid the price. And the Bible says we should be living as though we are free. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is, the Bible says, there is peace. So how, how peaceful are you today? Are you at peace? We're so accused sometimes. Right? That's right. We get accused, and most of it is self-inflicted. It's not just Joe's sermon, okay? It's more self-inflicted, and it's usually good intentions. We want to do something, or we set some goals, and these, those very things that we came up with are the things that make us get discouraged. And God's like, you guys. Okay, and we're coming to the end of the year. It's time we rethink, we evaluate. A lot of people kind of, okay, new year, new start, goals, resolutions, all those things. And a lot of times we set these things and then we don't make it and then we get destroyed. But these were good things. Right. Guys, I, I just don't see the early church being really that worked up about it. <laughs> like we are. Hey, end of the year. I didn't make, reach eight out of the ten of my goals. I only reached two. And... and and we get discouraged. So, I think the devil even uses good things to take the joy away. Yeah. If this lesson totally confused you, which it might have, <laughs> I do think we need more lessons on the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Look how often it's referred to in the New Testament. That's referred to in the Old Testament very, very differently. And, and the Spirit still existed and has always existed. 
But it says, let's, let's keep in step with the Spirit. Let's not put out the Spirit's fire. Singing, it, there's something about the Spirit with singing. Have you notice that? Yeah. Even in the context, it's, it's right around singing. There are some of you who are more in touch with the Spirit, I believe. I like being around those kind of people because that helps my soul. Because you're just a little more in the Spirit. You know, you don't want to be around a person that's just all upset and grumpy and nothing makes them happy. And, you know, but at the same time, somebody with songs, it talks about, wow, you, there's something about it. People who sing, who express themselves more, who praise God, they're, they're, they're free, aren't they? That's true. If you sit there, I ain't going to sing. I ain't going to sing. That's really helpful. I mean, and you can tell we're, we're kind of blocking the Spirit. Yeah. Right. And so the Bible says this. Are you going to live by the Spirit? That's the point of today. That's really one point, not all those three points. But really, are you going to live by the Spirit? And am I going to live by the Spirit? And it comes down to this. It says it's a mindset. Yeah. Your mind is either set on it or your mind is set on the sinful nature. That's as simple as I can make it. So what is your mindset this morning? Amen? Amen. Okay, let's stand. We're going to have a fellowship break. And uh, let's have a chance to talk. We can talk about the lesson and how you're confused. <laughs>